Well, everyone, I'm so excited for this conversation, something that is exceedingly timely given everything that's going on in the world. Looking to the ocean, the role of the water farmer in food security, both nationally and internationally, how we feed a population, a population that deserves nutritious, sustainable, and economically viable food. It's become an increasing challenge. We know that now, but there is a role that the ocean can play in our food system. And it's a food system that gives us a future and a nutritional security for people that is paramount to what we look to as we look to the future, one of urgency and one that can provide a lot of hope. Um, fish and seafood can fill a gap. In fact, if we manage our fisheries well, if we work on the different types of aquaculture with the ocean and that industry can supply six times everyone six times the amount of food that it does today, and in some cases help restore ocean ecosystems. So we're really excited to kind of spring you into action and learn from some of these best in class ethical aquaculturists. Joining me today, Senior Sales Manager of Pacifico Aquaculture, Chris Cumming. Excited to have you, Chris. Pacifico Aquaculture produces the only ocean raised um, true striped bass in the world. We also have Director of Business Development at Open Blue, Laurel Raffin. Open Blue is a mariculture farm farming cobia off of the coast of Panama. We have Director of Development of Kauai Shrimp, Mike Turner, a delicious land-based shrimp farm on the island of Kauai. CEO of Quarry Arctic, Alf Goren Knutsen, a third generation family farmer and the one suffering the most tonight, joining us at two in the morning from the Arctic Circle. So thank you, Alf Goren. And from Ideal Fish, Director of Sales and Marketing, James McKnight, a land-based farm farming Branzino. So it's about time that we've got beautiful locally raised um, Branzino. And I'm Jennifer Bushman, an aquaculture champion and an aquaculture strategist. I am really proud to have joining us today, Andrew Zimmerman, a four-time James Beard award-winning TV personality, writer, teacher, social justice advocate, and my partner in crime in championing this aquaculture, um, Andrew Zimmerman. And I wanna welcome everybody. And to tell you just really quickly as a housekeeping note, we're gonna take some questions at the end of this. So please, by all means, to, um, tuck your questions in, give them to us. We're gonna to try to get to all of them, but we probably won't. So what we'll do is we'll answer them, pop them up onto the Quarry Arctic blog within the coming days to at quarryarctic.com. So with that, I give it to Andrew. Thank you, Jennifer. Welcome everybody. I'm just thrilled to be here. Uh, I could talk about this subject forever. Uh, number one, because seafood is near and dear to my heart. It's been the thing that I uh, have, have loved for, to eat for my entire life and have uh, found as a professional that I prefer to cook my entire life. But by way of small introduction uh, to this, I thought I would uh, warm everybody up with just a small personal story uh, about how I became activated to this, uh, both as a social justice platform uh, civically, historically, anthropologically, and sociologically. Um, I, I grew up in New York City. I'm a child of the 60s. Uh, I was born in 61. And uh, it, it might have been as early as 1967 or as late as 1969. I really can't tell you which. Um, but I had spent a, a day and a half with my mother taking everything out of our garden. So I know that it was August. Uh, and processing it for days. Uh, she had a 30 by 30 foot uh, garden plot that produced a lot of tomatoes and zucchinis and eggplants and peppers and herbs, you know, typical uh, sort of summertime garden out at our Long Island home. And uh, it was exhausting work. Uh, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Processing all those tomatoes and, and roasting all the vegetables and you know, uh, freeze wrapping uh, all the uh, vegetable jams that we made and the different dishes and zucchini breads and think that we, things that we would make for friends. Um, and uh, I remember going to sleep, just passing out uh, after all that was done. And I remember my mother waking me up at about 3.34 in the morning. And I was, uh, I was shocked. I didn't know what we were waking up for. And she had been up 
uh, throughout the night after I had gone to bed, sort of cleaning up and, and putting everything away. And we, we got in the car with a thermos of uh, really sweet, milky uh, tea that we like to drink in the morning together. And we drove mile down to the local beach and we sat in the dunes and watched the sun start to come up. And, and before the, the actual uh, uh, dawn itself, the sky started to lighten to that dark blue. And I heard rustling to my left and dozens and dozens of men were pulling these giant 35 foot uh, white fishing boats, uh, you know, open gunnels, just big rowboats. Um, and, you know, there was a good five, six foot surf uh, on the Atlantic Ocean. And these guys were, you know, locked doors and rowed out backwards through the surf. You kept thinking the boats were going to tip over. Huge mounds of netting in the middle of these boats. And I was fascinated by it. And my mother explained to me that they were going to set the nets uh, to sit out there during the day. And then they would pull in uh, the nets uh, that they had set uh, the, the previous night. And that this was something that had endlessly repeated itself almost identically uh, for thousands and thousands of years in cultures all around the world. And I remember, so you can clearly see why it is that I do what I do and the stories that I tell on television. Uh, but I remember asking my mother why she wanted me to see this. And she said to me, she said, because in a couple of years, it's not going to exist anymore. My mother was very prescient. It, it stopped existing for a while. The, the, the fishing industry in Long Island changed in the, in the early 70s. And these small uh, family businesses that ran their own seafood shops and you know, they sold retail, they sold wholesale uh, and fished for whatever they could seasonally was a disappearing way of life. And I've been fascinated uh, by the rhythms of the ocean, the food that comes out of the ocean. And most importantly, our changing global structure around economies, availability, uh, weather, uh, uh, social tastes and popularity ever since. It has become an endlessly fascinating subject for me. Um, I also wanna give a little more context to this dialogue for folks that may not be uh, familiar with the subject. Um, the, uh, our, the C-19 pandemic has had a rippling effect across the fish and seafood sector which is an industry that has a large proportion of its income tied to food service. Unlike other ingredients, and this is a fact that has shocked people, you know, ever since March when restaurants uh, shut down, whenever I'm talking to groups, 75% of the fish and seafood in America is eaten outside of the home. We are one of the lowest per capita consumers of fish and seafood, despite the fact that we produce nearly 5.5 million tons of fish and seafood in America every year. The United States is the largest net seafood importer in the world with nearly a 62 to 65% trade deficit, which is what motivated President Trump to sign an executive order on May 7th that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, I believe like so many on this panel that sustainable domestic aquaculture can play a significant role in helping bring greater availability of fish and seafood to vulnerable communities as well. Communities that desperately need access to the essential nutritional benefits of seafood. At the present, aquaculture only contributes 8% of total fish and seafood either reared or caught in the United States. Shockingly, we rank 16th in the world in aquaculture production. Now we all know that done poorly, aquaculture can damage sensitive ecosystems, disrupt communities and pose a threat to human health. But more importantly, and increasingly with every year that I've been more hyper aware than I was when I was a little child, over the course of the last uh, four decades, when done well, it's a force for ecological, economical and social good. And as you will find out for those that are not aware, there are huge efforts being made to help build sustainable aquaculture systems in the United States. This requires action and collaboration to ensure that this relatively new effort here in our country can scale, and it needs to scale, to meet the challenges head on while providing our country with a balance of wild caught and sustainably raised fish from U.S. waters. Um, like Jennifer, like our panelists, I believe that we can tackle food injustice as well through greater access to fish and seafood, specifically 
uh, ethical aquaculture. Um, I find it interesting as well, just turning through my notes here, that seafood is among the highest traded food commodities uh, in the world. And the United States is both the top importer and among the top five exporters of seafood. So we're planted fairly well on both sides of that equation. Um, but the general question that I'd like to start out with for our panelists is this one. How is it that we're going to collectively survive and ideally thrive trying to build more ethical aquaculture systems uh, here in America and for those of you that are involved in international work uh, around the world? Because the goal, I think, is to be able to provide more food for more people without jeopardizing our wild stocks or upending the delicate balance and ecosystem that we all uh, want to preserve. So uh, James, I hate to do it to you, buddy, uh, but James, Mc James McKnight, you're in the upper right corner of my screen, so I'll let you have at that one first. Andrew, I was hoping you'd, you'd actually call my name out there. It's, uh, it's uh, first of all, it's an absolute privilege on, on everyone on behalf of uh, Ideal Fish. It's an absolute privilege to be uh, sitting here on this panel uh, with, with, with such an important topic discussing. Thanks, Andrew, for the introduction. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so I, I have lots to say. I'll kind of keep it brief on this subject. We are involved in recirculating aquaculture. We're a company that's located about 85 miles north of New York City and about 120 miles southwest of Boston. Um, we grow a Bronzino in a controlled environment, uh, controlled to the point where we actually create the environment from the level of salt in the water to the oxygen level to the temperature, full control of the environment. What's really exciting about this is that it has no negative environmental impact. We are able to produce a high quality protein 52 weeks out of the year, regardless of the snow is falling or the sun is shining and deliver it into the markets within 24 hours of harvest. We believe this is a game changer. We absolutely believe it's a game changer. Um, um, so, um, you know, we're not upsetting the environment. We're able to go into areas and, and industrial areas that have been run down. We're able to take over run down large factories and, and fit them out with, uh, with our technology. So just to put it in a quick nutshell, and I'll, I'll be quiet in a second, theoretically, or not theoretically, realistically, you can take a RAS facility, it's all self-contained, and you can put it anywhere in the world. So Andrew, when you talk about food security, when you talk about people not being able to get a healthy quality, fresh seafood, among many, many answers that RAS you know, provides, this is one of them. So we're extremely excited about this technology. It, it's fascinating, James. A, a, a quick follow-up. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, given your type of business and everyone else's is different, although there are other panelists whose work that I know and products that I've eaten, and I'm a little, I'm, I'm very familiar with their uh, products and their business models. Um, just to put a circle around it, your business, because of where it's situated and, and the, the actual infrastructures that you're building, is also an economic development program in mm -hmm. places in, in our country that could use jobs 52 weeks a year as tech, other technologies develop. This is a place where we're actually, and, and with, with limited uh, uh, human need, uh, you're actually growing jobs in places like upstate New York. Well, that's it, Andrew. I mean, if I, if I could talk, go on and on and on, I would. And that's certainly one of the things I would say. One of the huge advantages is we can go into depressed areas as long as they're close to the market and we can create jobs. Fantastic. It's a win-win across the board. You know, we haven't found anything negative uh, as an industry to do with RAS as of yet. So it's, it is a wonderful solution. A, a, a small part of the overall aquaculture community Right, so we're not looking to replace anything. We're, we're just coming to the table with a with additional solutions here. So yeah, Chris, how would you apply what it is that you guys are doing to this survive and thrive uh, introductory question that I threw out? Yeah, I think I think when you're talking about trying to you know build acceptance in aquaculture and how it you know can be a solution to food supply, 
aquaculture as a, you know, an industry on a commercial scale is still very young. So I think what we're doing right now is super important. We're talking about it. And we've got a great group of companies right here that are really proving to the world that we can do aquaculture, you know, whether it's through a RAS system or open ocean or, you know, other techniques, we can do it in a responsible and healthy way. We're doing it in ways that are good for the ocean. We're keeping the ocean and the water healthy. We're producing healthy proteins and we're getting it out there to the people into the communities that really need it. So I think this is the first step. I think talking about it in education. Uh, Chris, you, you raised something that for those who are just, you know, are new to the, to this, it's a very, very complex issue, the whole notion of aquaculture and how we ramp that up. And there's a lot of concerns that people have, but you mentioned something that I, I wanted to get to before the end, we're going to talk about some of the myths and uh, misinformation that's out there, but you talked about uh, certain systems that actually keep the ocean healthier. Can you describe what you mean by that? Yeah, so, so our farm, um, talk a little bit about that. We raise our fish eight miles offshore. We're about 70 miles south of San Diego, so pretty close to the U.S. market. And eight miles offshore, we're very far away from any sort of industrial pollutants or contaminants that you might otherwise find near the coastlines, near major you know, cities. And being that far offshore is, you know, we're in beautiful, clean, healthy water. And everything that we do on the farm itself in an effort to keep it that way is very important. We don't use chemicals, no copper antifouls on the nets, nothing that would go into the water that would be detrimental to the water itself or to the health of the fish. And I would, I would have to assume that part of that other healthy equation is that uh, especially in your business, raising these fish offshore uh, in a nutrient-rich environment with swift, fast-moving uh, water is part of your business model to raise the, the fish to the quality that your company believes it should. Uh, but it also uh, means that, you know, for every pound of fish that comes off of your farm is one less pound of fish that comes out of a uh, a fishery somewhere else in the world, some of which are managed well, others are not managed well. A lot of people assume wrongly that all wild fisheries are playing by the same rules. They, they like to ding the aquaculture world, uh, but they never talk about the differences in fisheries management of wild stocks. Yep, absolutely. You know, there's, there's good wild and there's bad wild. There's good farm and there's bad farm. And it's important to ask the ask the questions about where your fish is coming from. Use the resources that are available, like the, the Seafood Watch app or um, whatever else is out there and, and ask the questions. You want to know where your fish is coming from and making sure it's coming from a responsible source. Uh, despite uh, appearances over the last, last 15 years to the contrary, I don't get a chance to eat every type of food on planet Earth, uh, but I have had a chance to uh, consume your product and I've had a chance to consume uh, Mike's product, both of which are uh, absolutely delicious and wonderful. Um, Mike, can, can you address the question of survive and thrive and talk to us uh, about uh, shrimp farming in Kauai? Because, you know, there are certain uh, fish tales uh, that have gone on around the world. There's, I think there's no more confusing issue uh, for consumers uh, than shrimp. One of the most popular uh, seafood items uh, any, anywhere and everywhere in the world um, where there's so much confusion about differences between farmed and wild caught and variations within each. So if you could uh, talk about how you guys are surviving and thriving and also address that question about your product in particular. Um, absolutely, Andrew, thank you for having this, putting this together, Jennifer. And uh, yeah, our, we are a breeding facility uh, in uh, Kauai and to breed for the genetic uh, advances that we need, we need a lot of shrimp. So what I'm responsible for is about a million pounds of shrimp a year to sell as meat shrimp. So we deal with an international, our core business is breeding and selling live broodstock to hatcheries all around the world. So we deal with our clients, um, our hatcheries, and they will grow the shrimp out, mate them, grow them out to a certain size, and then I'll sell them to individual farmers. Now, these farmers are left to go out and manage their own ponds. 
Um, shrimp farming is rife with disease in these areas. This is India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, China. And so they manage their ponds with chemicals and antibiotics. So we send the golden shrimp to Asia and what comes back is anybody's guess. And you know, so, so little of the shrimp is actually tested that it comes back. But there's a huge movement in the retail sector that they only buy from certified uh, facilities, whether they be a certified feed uh, farm that are, produces the feed, certified farms, uh, certified processing plants, and they'll pay more money for that shrimp. So through the demand of bringing in, you know, higher quality product, you know, it's gradually changing. But, uh, you know, as, uh, as James was speaking about the, the RAS systems, that's really where the future of this business model is going. There's no more taking a D9 tractor and start plowing through the mangroves and use it up until it's done and then move on down the road. Um, it's not sustainable. It's not, you know, it's not environmentally friendly. There's just, there's a lot of issues in these third world countries that if these individual players don't go through the certification process and then be audited regularly, you know, we can't really control it. So um, I see the R, the RAS systems, um, even in the third world, really, really taking hold because you can control the environment. It's biosecurity that keeps this disease out of these, you know, these this production. And if they get 45 gram shrimp and they don't have to use chemicals and, you know, they're using biosecurity, you know, good filtered water, their sources of water are good. You know, they're, you know, feeding people or, or employing people with living wages. You know, these are, this is good for the world and good for the planet. I know we don't use any chemicals whatsoever on our farm, you know, and it's, uh, like I said, Hawaii is probably the best place in the world to grow shrimp, but it's also the most expensive. Um, I'll let it go off to somebody else because as we all can, we could go on and on and on. But, uh, but yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're positioned to, um, you know, join into the, you know, the new technology because the past is, the past is unsustainable. We're sustainable, but they're not. Uh, when you talk about fisheries management and biosecurity, though, and you talk about uh, imported shrimp, uh, is one of the secrets uh, to the future of the sauce making here uh, getting uh, shrimp production, aquaculture uh, production with shrimp uh, increased in countries where there is uh, more accountability and better fisheries management in general? Oh, absolutely. It's, um, you know, it is, uh, since I started with this company nine years ago, um, just to, to see the improvements, you know, year to year to year, it's really been um, absolutely phenomenal. And so it, it will be, the industry will sustain itself if they can produce. I mean, the demand now is, you know, right now with food service out of the equation, I mean, that was 70% of what we did, you know, but then my retail sector is, is quadruple. So it's kind of this or that. It's, uh, with shrimp and with the wholesomeness of shrimp, we need to be close to the end user. You know, we're way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I, you know, find me on a globe if you can. You know, I mean, it's uh, <laughs> we got to be a little closer to the end users because everything gets you know gobbled up in expenses. You know, it's moving product around, whether it be flown in or or containers or what have you. So, you know, the future is RAS and it's land based, and I think we could do some huge things in in the U.S. to to really bolster the economy, and it's it's very exciting the new technologies that are coming through, so. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Alf, tell us about your company and about your survive and thrive strategies. Thank you, <clears throat> and, and Jennifer. Um, yes, I, I run a salmon um, farming, a salmon in the north of Norway uh, uh, and doing it uh, our own way. We have, uh, like uh, Chris said, it's a young industry. Uh, we've been a part of it for, 46 years uh, now, uh, our company, uh, out of the 50 years the, the salmon industry has uh, existed in Norway. And I've been a part of the company for 15 years and the uh, and, uh, development just the last 10 years are amazing. Uh, and there are so many more things still to come uh, from the industry and still more to to develop and, and better ways of doing what we're doing. But we, you know, we have the conditions we have for farming in Norway that are uh, extraordinary. And that's why we also produce 50% of the farm salmon in Norway. Uh, but I believe also like the other ones here that recirculated technology and, and those things will be a part of the, of the future of growing more uh, seafood for, 
for the whole world and for feeding the world. But uh, I also believe that it's pos still possible to do it sustainable and increase the production in Norway. And that's also why we're part of a, a flow through system that will take uh, some of the fish uh, on land, uh, doing, uh, uh, taking advantage of the same natural conditions as we have here in our area and uh, using a feed that still has a lot of developing to do there too also and uh, replacing protein sources, uh, uh, taking less fish out of the sea to produce more fish there are so many so many amazing things that still can be done if, if you want to do it and if you want to do something uh, extraordinary like we have uh, been doing uh, for the last uh, 10 years. I, I think to most consumers, uh, farm shrimp and farm salmon are two of the, uh, that will probably be the first two uh, seafood products that come to mind uh, to the yeah. consumer. Um, the, the salmon industry, uh, aquaculture salmon industry, mm -hmm. took a huge hit decades ago. There were a lot of bad practices there. Uh, yeah. You know, you mentioned uh, the feed system. There's also the netting system, uh, yeah. number of fish raised per cubic yard in the water and so on and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. Could you just uh, briefly tell people uh, what your company is doing? Because I, I know that, that now, just over the last decade, as you referenced, one of the big changes is going from an eight to one, 10 to one model for feed to, to essentially a neutral model for feed mm -hmm. where you're, you're essentially one to one, which might as well be zero to zero. Um, yeah. But th there's lots of different things that uh, the, the many companies are doing right now. Uh, farm salmon uh, is, a, is a great product. And can you tell us why uh, and what you guys are doing? Yeah, farm salmon has a has a bad reputation. That's for sure. It's uh, it's an industry that has uh, had their problems, uh, and it's always there's always some challenges uh, when you raise a, a wild fish uh, and uh, and try to make it a farm fish. Uh, but I think the industry has uh, grown a lot, and it's still, like I said, a young industry. Um, what we have done is is uh, thrived on the fact that uh, we. We found the right customers. We listened to the customers. We did changes that uh, that uh, the customers wanted us to do. Uh, and uh, also me being <laughs> coming from outside the industry and in with a different view of things uh, uh, made those changes. And we have done... Uh, we don't use any net, ter net treatment, uh, copper treatments on net. We don't... Uh, we have less fish. Uh, we actually have... Uh, um, we actually have 25% less fish in each net uh, to make sure the fish thrives and, and grows better. We don't use any chemicals or antibiotics like the, the, <laughs> the reputation we have uh, as an industry. Uh, we, uh, we have developed our own feed that actually has a protein, uh, we're a 0 to, 0 0.48 to 1 uh, producer of uh, protein. So that's amazing. And also we have gone back to where it was with omega-3, uh, lifting the omega-3 levels uh, back to the wild salmon and, and even a little bit over. And you're able to do all of these things with new technology, with the algae growth that uh, Corbion, a company that we work with, do. And, and there are many, many more things to come when it comes to feed and when it comes to the development. Like I said, it's uh, it's an uh, it's a very interesting industry to be a part of, and it's a very uh, very important industry for uh, growing more fish and, and feeding the world in the future. So that's why we're trying to do. We're trying to listen to the customers. We're trying to listen to the uh, all the possible things we could do and, and some of them are of course not uh, the best ones but we have been I think we have been good in choosing our battles and choosing the things that uh, have moved us forward to where we are today with the help of uh, a lot of people yeah thanks Alf uh, mm -hmm. Laurel what's your tell us about your company and your survive and thrive strategy uh, in today's ever-changing marketplace so Open Blue was built on a, on a dream about 10 years ago to raise the healthiest fish in a responsible and sustainable way to feed the world to come. 
Um, and our mission has not changed, although our methods have evolved and gotten richer throughout the years. Uh, that's our main, our main goal, because we know by 2050, the demand for good nutrient, good quality food is going to be bigger than the world is going to be able to sustain at the way that we're going. So what we've done is we've gone eight miles offshore, no different to Pacific. Well, Laurel froze there for a second, at least on my screen. Uh, and when her computer buffers, uh, we will uh, come back to her Go. and let her- oh. um, In 270 feet of my back. Yeah, you're back. We're doing the best we can with the Canadian uh, internet here, but- um, so what we've done is we've gone eight miles offshore to open ocean waters in 270 feet of ocean currents where we can mimic the natural environment of a cobia as closely as possible while still, still keeping the good in and the bad out. And the result is a beautiful, sustainably raised, high in omega-3, and actually we're in good company on this panel with the only three fish in the world that have been granted the American Heart Check Association program. It's Quarry, Pacifico, and Open Blue Cobia. And I think more than ever, consumers are, are asking, where did my food come from? Especially their fish. And what a great time for us to be able to tell our story. Because strong communities build strong companies. And strong companies are able to provide food for the world. But not just for today. We, whatever we're doing today needs to be a model that can be shared, can be grown, and can be done, whether it's off the shore of, of the US, whether it's done in Panama, where we're doing but the really cool thing about this industry is that although we all are competing for certain spots on certain menus or certain retail positions, we're all here to grow because we can't do it alone. And so that's what the difference in our industry is. And in doing that, we're supporting our local economies. It's a model that can move. It's not just for Panama. It's just for, not just for wherever these companies are operating. It's something that can transfer. So we've got a model that works. And that's what's really cool about being a part of a company like Open Blue where we're building a beautiful, sustainable, delicious, nutritious, sashimi grade fish, but we're also working on a platform that can grow to other species that will continue to feed the world. And, and really importantly for those here in the domestic market in the United States, uh, we're consuming a ton of fish, but we're importing so much of it. So why not do it with companies? And look, you know, you, rep you guys all represent companies in many different uh, countries. Some have ownership in one country and are actually raising fish in another because it makes best sense to do that. But the more that we can increase the quality of aquaculture and raise, raise the trust to the consumer, I think the better off. The rising tide really does uh, lift all boats, no pun intended, uh, in the seafood uh, industry. That's a great point, Laurel. Um, one of the things that uh, I read in preparation uh, for talking to you guys was the University of California, Santa Barbara uh, abstract uh, that was prepared uh, by uh, Hallie Froelich et al. About eight or nine different people contributed uh, to this. Um, and I wanted to use their five guiding principles as a way to kick off our next uh, set of questions. And we have five panelists, so I'm going to let you each have a pass at each of them, although I do know that some of you have expertise in certain ones. Um, and so I may come back around uh, to other parts of you, uh, to other panelists with different parts of these uh, questions. But I wanted to set the table a little bit uh, for those who may not be familiar. Um, in the opening to the, uh, to the paper, it reads, the United States seafood industry is undergoing rapid change as a result of the current trade war with China, ongoing global COVID-19 pandemic, and new governance mandates. The new executive order on promoting American seafood competitiveness and economic growth, this is a May 2020 executive order, proposes wild capture fisheries deregulation and prioritization of aquaculture with an emphasis on offshore development. Recent disruption of wild caught seafood supply and demand could create space for sustainable aquaculture growth, but expansion could also undermine wild fisheries livelihoods and economics if integrated management between the industries is ignored. And uh, the paper essentially reviews the current state of the US seafood industry and suggests five guiding principles to better manage US fisheries and aquaculture. And by US fisheries, they're referring to the wild ones. 
And the first one is this idea of making precise and strategic fisheries reforms that continue to support wild fisheries. Um, and Alf, can you talk about that? Because there are wild salmon fisheries um, around the world, but uh, farm-raised salmon is a huge global industry as well. So when it comes to how those uh, fisheries reforms, uh, regardless of country of origin, uh, might affect the relationship between wild fisheries and uh, the aquaculture industry, uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, I can try my best. It's not my uh, it's not uh, my expertise. Uh, the wild fishery. It's uh, the farmed fisheries, of course, uh, uh, small uh, compared to the wild fisheries. And uh, U.S. And, uh, and Canada probably has the biggest one. And in Norway, the the wild fisheries is really small. It's a mm -hmm. it's a small industry. It's a small business that's uh, more. Uh, a historic business, and uh, and that's why it's still part of of, uh, of the as an industry still in Norway. I think it's 200 metric tons compared to the 1.3 million metric tons we produce in in uh, in farmed. Uh, and we are doing uh, actually in Norway there there are laws that uh, take more care of the of the wild salmon than the farm salmon, and they are all their their rights and all their uh, right to fish and, and right to, to take care. It's more important that the footprint of the farm salmon is uh, not affecting the, the wild salmon where we are. So we have, we're raising the Atlantic salmon that is uh, a part of the natural habitat there and, and we are always measured on, on, the, on the footprint we make on, 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 the, on the wild fisheries. Uh, and uh, late, uh, the latest since 2009, I think uh, the, the Norwegian farm industry has been held back because of uh, we reached a point where we were in in uh, not in balance with that. Uh, so they have been struggling finding ways to regulate the farm business or the farm industry to to not have a a bigger footprint on the wild uh, fishes. And uh, that's why we now have a, a traffic light system that uh, uh, every second year gives uh, the 13 different areas of Norway uh, a chance to uh, grow if the footprint is low on the wild uh, uh, salmon and, and trout uh, in, in Norway. And that's a model that has been tested in Norway now for a while and I know there's different models in Canada and in the US also and, and trying to find ways to to measure it and um, in Norway also there's uh, there's not a lot of research on the wild fish wild uh, habitat and the wild fish so it's uh, it's difficult finding ways to balance those two but I think uh, I think the, the, at least in Norway uh, we are on the right way there has to be a there has to be a balance uh, between those two. And, and you, you, you referenced a really important point a, a minute yeah. or two ago. Um, it would be uh, literally impossible to increase production of wild caught fish mm. yeah. um, because we're already, uh, and, and, and I'm not a fisherman, but I know this to be true, because we're already fishing those yeah. uh, uh, stocks at maximum yeah. sustainable levels. So yes. if we want to enjoy salmon or any of the other seafood products represented in the panel, which are also fish are being uh, yeah. fished at essentially maximum levels, the answer has yeah. to be aquaculture. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. It's, it's, uh, that's also why we as an industry in, the, in salmon farming has been, have been working on the fish in fish out ratio uh, because the wild fisheries are at the point where they are not sustain, it's not sustainable to take out more. Then we have to look at the ways of, uh, of taking more care of the fisheries we have and, and taking more advantage of the byproducts and all of those things to, to make sure we can produce more uh, out of the farm industry. So uh, that's, uh, that's correct. Um, Chris, I, I wanted to ask you about this too because I, I know your your company uh, uh, pretty well. Um, the executive order um, includes a directive to reduce burdens on domestic fishing and to increase production 
uh, on the aquaculture uh, side. That's really one of the big intents of this uh, executive order. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to it in relationship to what, what your company is doing and how you see this since you're doing so much business here in the United States. Yeah, I, I think Alf hit the nail on the head is, you know, wild and aquaculture need to exist together. There has to be balance. And for Pacifico, we're the only ones in the world that are ocean raising a true striped bass. The, the same genetic lines, the same species that you'll see coming off the East Coast. You know, wild striped bass on the East Coast, also called rockfish, it's one of their prized possessions. And that fishery itself has been very poorly managed over the past few decades. And those stocks have been steadily declining. Catch limits have been cut back year after year. The seasons get shorter and shorter. Catch limits are lower and lower. And Pacifico offers a solution that can help take pressure off of those stocks. There's this ongoing battle with wild striped bass between the commercial side, which supplies restaurants and, and you know hotels and retail markets, and then the sport fishing side. And they don't play well and you know it's it, it seems like a never-ending battle that doesn't it's not going towards anything good so pacifico we now offer a year-round solution for a true striped bass that restaurants chefs can put on their menu they can feel confident in it they can put it on the menu knowing that they'll be able to get it the season's not going to end in two weeks the pricing stays stable so we're building a lot of confidence in a in a product that hasn't had that and we're providing a solution that can now provide this product year round and then at the same time help take the pressure off of those wild stocks, which is hands down the most important thing. So we, we've seen, you know, again, this year, Monterey Bay moved a couple of the catch methods on those wild striped bass, a couple of the catch methods over to red. There's only one of those catch methods that's now rated green by Seafood Watch and that's hook and line, which is, you know, definitely the most sustainable method, but a lot of people are losing access, more and more access to that fish. And that's where we come in and we can provide that fishy around to those people that want it. Uh, the second guiding principle uh, here is integrating aquaculture and wild fisheries through an ecosystem uh, based approach. And the, uh, the paper goes on to say, there is potential for better integrated management for US wild capture fisheries and aquaculture. The two sectors are mostly managed separately, even though they interact directly and indirectly in space through feed, seed, and markets. Um, it's fascinating. And it goes on to say that uh, the function of the previous lead agency for aquaculture was the Department of Agriculture. Now, uh, NOAA is designated as the lead. And so the feeling is that there's a stronger potential to align principles from ecosystem-based fisheries management and the ecosystem approach to aquaculture. In other words, there's a better chance now for coexistence. Um, Laurel, I, I don't know if your connection, you were able to hear me uh, when I was reading that, but it seems to me that, you know, with the, the fish that you guys are growing down in Panama, it, it's kind of the same situation that Chris had. There's, there's also a wild fishery uh, for this that also is used as a sport fish, as well as a uh, commercial industry for this very, very delicious product. And I was wondering if maybe you could talk about that uh, integration of an ecosystem-based approach. Well, I think that there definitely is room and needs to, we need to find room to have both the wild and aquaculture operations acting synonymously, it's, it's, it's not even an option. We need that in order to sustain what we need to, to feed the market. But that said, like site sourcing is something that we've been researching forever, way before aquaculture was as primary and forefront as it is now. We have the best scientists and most of them, a lot of them are operating in the US and we're giving this information off to other countries who are, are doing it. So if we are able to use the research that we're doing where we can find what relationships between species are harmonious, which ones are not, which ones do we need to avoid? We can, we can study benthic flooring, you know, we can see what effects are happening with each of the actions that we're taking. And this has been going on for years. So if we take the research that we have already, 
capitalize on the experts that we've got who've been studying in universities like the University of Miami, who we work very, very closely with, take this and move forward, we can enhance what we're already doing with aquaculture so that we can also make the wild stocks prosper as well by whatever we need to do. And some fish like to stage, some don't. Kobe are a fish where they like to have something that they are near to stage, but they're not a schooling fish. So we already know that. We know Kobe are native to the area where we're already farming it. So that's one of the reasons that we chose that is because we know that they already habitat well there. So there are things that are already known that we just need to cross the barrier of one versus the other and start looking at each other as people who can, who can help to feed, feed the world together. Uh, Mike, I wanted you to chime on, in on this as well because the, uh, you were talking about reducing environmental impacts when you were talking about uh, the old system of uh, farming in the uh, shrimp in the mangroves. So I was just wondering if, if you had a comment on this integration of uh, wild and farmed uh, and the ecosystem issue. Oh, you're gonna unmute yourself, buddy. There we go. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. I'm very good at Teams, not very good at Zoom, so I'm <laughs> getting better. <laughs> um, you know the um, the crossover between uh, wild. You know where we grow our shrimp. There are no wild species uh, to speak of. Um, most of the, our shrimp, or the you know the uh, the genus of our our shrimp, is uh, Mexican number one white or the Baname white shrimp, and that's caught in the wild from Gulf of California down to the western side of Peru. And they have a, a very sustainable fishery and they've been around forever. I mean, it was the only shrimp I ever had in a restaurant in the 1970s. I mean, that was it. And uh, black tiger. Me, me too. We're old. Yeah, we are old. I don't want to date myself. It might be the beard. But uh, anyways, <laughs> the, um, um, the farm raised shrimp out of Asia initially was black tiger, which is also a species there that's indigenous to that area of the world. And as they started to farm it um, and these countries, you know, this is hard capital for them to export. And then suddenly black tigers were everywhere and, you know, in the mainland U.S. and all over the world. And uh, then they started having these disease issues. So the, the integration between both, um, um, I'm not sure how that, that folds together, um, especially if we're talking about doing Vanamy white shrimp maybe on the, the mainland U.S. But it's um, the, there's always been a problem between domestic whites and the Gulf you know, and the Gulf of Mexico and, uh, and farm raised shrimp to the point where they've had public policy that actually tariffs these certain of these company, uh, countries, pardon me, importing this, uh, this shrimp as an anti dumping situation where, you know, basically the price is so cheap on the one side and they're trying to sustain their, you know, their fishery, which is a wild caught fishery seasonally in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And I've never understood that because they're very, very different animals. They're apples and oranges and, uh, you know, I think if you, you market yourself as something different and what is your distinctive competence, well, then there's a place for both of those to exist. Because if we can really let a lot of shrimp in to the U.S. and or, you know, cultivate it here, more people are going to be able to use it. The price is going to be lower and more people that don't have access to, you know, center the plate protein in a, you know, fine dining restaurant, you know, can buy a bag of shrimp, you know, and, uh, and make a very reasonable price. And it's a great source of protein as long as it's grown sustainably. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of components to that, but it's, uh, but I see where there's, you know, there's, there's definitely ways, there's synergies between all of this. And it's just, it's great that the technology is moving so quickly as it seems to be in all the other species we're talking about. And that's, that's yeah. very, very exciting. Um, James, the, the third uh, pillar here is addressing social resistance to aquaculture. And while all of our panel, panelists can speak to this and it's, it's different for everyone, I, I can't think of a better person. When, when you say that you're raising Bronzino uh, in, in, in upstate New York, um, I think for a lot of people, that's, that's, that's a huge shocker. Uh, and they might think that there are, I mean, there's, there's gonna be a lot of myths associated with that. Um, and since, you know, your facilities are, are relatively new uh, compared to uh, ALF's uh, uh, 
uh, salmon farm in in Norway. Uh, maybe you could talk about uh, the um, what it's going to take to increase uh, consumer demand for aquaculture product. Because I know there are people who want to do it because they they want to preserve wild stocks. There are others that do it because it's it's what's coming into their market. Um, we have such high U.S. consumption of imported farmed seafood. It's almost like we don't care here. I hear certain people, while they're serving me imported farm seafood in their house, telling me they only get wild. And I don't have the heart to tell them that they've either been lied to or didn't know where their fish was coming from, as Chris uh, was talking about. Um, but you know, aquaculture gets, uh, suffers from a lot of mythologies and there is social resistance uh, to it, part of, partly I think because of the confusion in the, in the marketplace. Um, but I wonder if you could talk about it because I, you must have to explain yourself and what you do all the time to your friends. And yeah, thank you for the question. And I, before, before, I, before I answer that question, I just wanna go back to, you know, to put it bluntly, this is, the, our, our industry is, you know, the state of the industry and the perception of the industry is a mess. You know, the right hand is fighting the left hand. They don't know what each other are doing. The wild people are fighting the farm people. It's not, it is not a, a good solution, right? So first of all, we have to get on the same page. I, I, I am, uh, you know, it's staggering, you know, based on, on the reputation of our country, um, um, how little seafood we produce over here, whether it be wild or farmed. And, and I don't think people understand, in fact, I know they don't understand uh, that, that two things. First of all, we, we have to start working together. And secondly, you know, aquaculture used to be an option. It's not an option anymore. It is now a necessity. And people have no idea what, what kind of necessity it is. Uh, you know, we need to feed, feed the planet. Uh, it's not realistic to think that we can take up more grass and raise more cattle. It's just not sustainable. Um, so anyway, I can go on about that for a long time. I won't. And you're quite right, Andrew. 90, over 90% 90 of our seafood's imported. It's staggering. And I think like 5% of it's inspected. You're know, talking to Mike. With, I mean, it's absolutely staggering. It just yeah. blows my mind. This is America, you know? Um, absolutely staggering. Don't get me started on USDA organic standard. Don't. That's Don't get me started. Don't get, <laughs> that's, a whole other, that's a whole other story. Uh, but I'm sure we all we all we all we all share that sentiment. So going back to you, you know, I've been fortunate to be in this industry for nearly 30 years, and in my in my past life, I was in the salmon industry for quite a few years. And you know, um, the, the the press have done a wonderful job, an absolute fantastic job, at poisoning the barrel and taking some bad situations, whether it be farms in Chile or whatever it may be, many years ago, and really capitalizing and saying, hey, you know, Mr. Mr. Mrs. Consumer. Don't eat, wild, don't eat farm salmon, it's really bad. I've got a real story for you and you won't be able to sleep at night after I tell you. But the reality is this. I mean, the reality is if someone said to me, what, what's my biggest challenge today? Is it raising a good quality protein that tastes really good? The answer is no. <laughs> Our biggest challenge, and I think I speak as a community here, is education. People just don't have a clue. They're getting information coming in from all sorts of areas. I mean, it's absolute mayhem. Um, fraud, I mean, it's another subject that's just rampant. There are three main culprits in the world that fall under, <laughs> that, 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 that sit on the top podium when it comes to fraud. One's olive oil, the other one's honey, and you can guess what the third one is. Um, you know, Atlantic salmon can look just like a nice king, wild king salmon. Anyway, that's another, that's another topic altogether. So, so really what it comes down to, answer your question, Andrew, it's education. And, uh, you know, throughout, when you go out to a consumer and they try the product, um, they'll say, well, you know, I don't need, I don't need farm fish. Um, you know, well, and so it's a whole educational process to, and it is, there's no shortcut here. There's absolutely no shortcut. We have to educate the consumer on the benefits and the necessities of, of aquaculture, because the reality is this, the majority of companies raising fish, um, certainly in North America and in Europe, they do it the right way. Just support the companies that are doing it the right way. So you know, the challenge is how do we get the consumer to identify what those right companies are? And everyone sitting around these table, this table does it the right way. 
uh, education, education, education. And it's, and it's really for us, it's not just that, it's traceability, it's transparency. It's talking about so many more people as we know, where's my fish coming from? We love that. You know, we want to, we're putting our cards on the table. You know, we have a QR code that goes on each fish and we want people to be able to scan it or enter in that QR code or that, that trace code onto a website and it'll tell them everything about the fish, what tank it grew up in, when it was harvested, when it was shipped. Absolute transparency is essential to turn the tide on the misinformation that's just plagued our industry. Um, education, education, education. What's the single biggest thing, uh, Chris, that you would want to tell uh, consumers uh, if you're uh, also aligned with James's, and I'm sure you are, education, education, education. Uh, since, since most consumers purchase seafood, according to studies, by recognition, taste, and price, what would you want consumers to know about the industry in general that would help address some of the issues that James brought up? Can I pick two instead of one? Sure. Uh, no, absolutely. When somebody uh, tells me, name your favorite thing, I give them three. So perfect. Um, one is seafood's easy to cook. I think that's a huge misconception. People are afraid to cook seafood at home. Like you mentioned in, in the beginning, majority of seafood is consumed outside of the home in America. So I think, you know, part of the education piece is, you know, educating people on the fact that seafood's easy to cook. It doesn't take much. It's pretty basic. You know, I, and, and by the way, it's, it's, cooks. and it's fast too. I mean, I just, I, you know, I cook seafood all the time on my live IG and our tape stuff and put videos up. And it's, I always tell people, they're like, well, I don't have a lot of time. It's like, well, buy a couple pieces of fish. Yeah. It, they cook very quickly. So thank you for doing that. Please do more because I love yeah. those videos. And you could, by the way, you could cook it every single, you can broil it, boil it, poach it, braise it, so grill it, sear it. Yeah. And, and most of the fish. Don't get me started. <laughs> I mean, I, for me, that, that might be one of the biggest. And, you know, the other one is, is like James was saying, just education, you know, do take, do the homework. You know, look into the companies that are doing it like, like everybody that's sitting around this table right here. There are too many good options right now for farm raised fish. That conversation could have been a lot different 10 years, 20 years ago. But today, there are just too many good options of responsibly raised healthy seafood products. This is such an important issue. I, I, I wanna remind folks who are listening in, we're gonna go a couple minutes over so that we make sure to get your questions, but I, I, I wanna give our other panelists an opportunity to respond to this because it's, it's, it's slightly different for everyone. Mike, you are currently unmuted, so you don't have to do a darn thing. You can just, you can just talk. Um, but on this idea of, of social resistance, based on what you heard James and Chris talk, do you have anything to add to that or that you would like to mention? Um, you know, absolutely. The um, Seafood Watch through the Monterey Bay Aquarium has been very helpful. It's, it's sort of a, the standard, you know, that's out there. It's, it's very limited. A lot of people don't even know it exists, you know, but it's, uh, it points you in the right directions on, on where to go with your seafood. And it really is, you know, the traceability thing. We have barcoding on all of our animals. I mean, I could tell you the line, the family line that spawned it, you know, if you need to. So um, traceability is very important. Um, but it's just the the basic element is education, as, as I believe James and both Chris agree with. People got to know there's a difference and there's a better choice to be made. And you're going to make the better choice if you're informed. And, uh, and you know, that'll just, that'll help that'll help this industry as a whole. You know, right now, like you said, we're a lot of people going a lot of different directions. We need to find the core of what this is and explain it to people that terrestrial animals are not gonna be able to supply the protein needs of this planet. And that seafood is the way it's gonna, you know, people are gonna be fed. And that's just the way it is. So education, once again, I think that's a very, very strong point. Alf, you, we, we talked about this a little bit uh, earlier. You know, the one of the those those articles that James was referencing from decades ago uh, were were most often aimed at bad actors in the uh, in the salmon space. 
Um, but when it comes to consumer preference, there are three big pillars. First three, recognition, taste, price. People recognize salmon, right? It looks different. It's red. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an easily identifiable fish in, in the case. Um, almost everyone has tasted it, uh, right? Because it's a very popular global fish. And uh, because there's uh, so much salmon produced uh, each year, it's, it's held some pretty steady pricing. Um, so what's your big challenge on the education front uh, when it comes to farmed Norwegian salmon? Uh, I think the, the first thing is that we uh, we spend too much time uh, defending ourselves instead of uh, telling the good stories about what we do. Um, for sure, that's uh, that's the first thing. There are too many people, uh, yeah, trying to just shoot back at our criticism instead of uh, telling the good stories and, and uh, doing good things. Um, so that's. Uh, that's the, the things I see that's important. Yeah. Laurel, do you, have, do you have an additional challenge? Because uh, unlike the products that the other uh, four panelists uh, are raising, your fish is relatively new to a lot of consumers. So this is, uh, I, I, I always say that I grew up with Open Blue because it was my first job at a university. And I remember going into a kitchen in New York City and I, I didn't know anything. I mean, maybe we don't, any of us know anything now, but I really did not know anything. And I went in with my cobia and I, I was explaining to this chef who was very well known. And I said, I've got a cobia for you to try. And he said, do you mean Kobe beef? And I said, you know, I don't know a lot, but I knew, do know there's a dead fish in this box and I'd really like you to try it. And now I've been at the company for almost nine years. And, and now we're going into kitchens and people are saying, oh my gosh, I've been wanting to try this fish. So I really do think that the exposure is happening. Um, but one of the things we did because of the exact uh, issue that you just raised, that people don't know what Cobia is, we did blind consumer testing across the major metropolitan areas of the US and some in Europe and Canada as well, and asked people, just general consumers, I know how often do you buy fish? If you were to, do you know what Cobia is? No, we don't buy very often. But if we told you that it was sustainably raised, it was, it was clean enough for sashimi grade, you know, has more omega-3s, it's heart healthy, all of the benefits that they weren't aware of, we resurveyed them at the end and they said, I would pick this up today. Like if you had this to buy today. So the one thing that we're encouraging people to be is not just to ask questions, but it's to be curious and to go beyond the media's portrayal of what we're supposed to think and go get your own opinion on what you think because there are a lot of people out there doing really, really great things who really want to tell you about it. So I think that is our biggest obstacle, but in being with the company since almost day one, I do think that we are getting there as an industry and the whole, the problem is if we could shout it from the rooftops and get everybody to hear us, we would be a lot further. Um, but it's just by word of mouth and the old saying, try it to buy it, you know, get it in people's mouths, have that conversation. And I always say within our team and with anybody, even if you have one more conversation today than you did yesterday, that's one more person who's informed who hopefully will tell somebody themselves. You know, the try it to buy it thing. I mean, I, I interact on the public side uh, a lot and I talk to people about seafood uh, almost every single day in, in one manner or another. And, and listening to everyone talk, I, I really think uh, we have to work with, with our, our retailers uh, in this country. Um, the, we, so many of us are so well-informed uh, on this issue. And I find that, I mean, number one, just look at the numbers, 75% of seafood in America is consumed in, in places other than the home, right? So automatically, right, we know that restaurants are out there and, and chefs are really interested in, they're really, really great uh, uh, advocates for your products and, and other really wonderful products out there in the space, right? Because I know, because I've served several of your products in some of my restaurants when they were open. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's a great story to tell people and people really like it and they get excited and they taste it and there's a big wow. What, 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 what's hard is that there are so few places in America right now where there's a knowledgeable person behind a counter to let them know, hey, in, one sentence, here's what's special about this fish, please try it. 
But at the other counter right next door, if there's a person behind the counter, by the way, because a lot of markets don't have a person behind the counter, uh, th there is all the chicken and the pork and the beef, and they've got cute little signs, and they're happy to talk to you about it. Uh, it's almost like seafood is uh, the, 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 the stepchild in the corner when it's actually so healthy uh, for us. Aquaculture is so good for our planet. It becomes a win-win-win on so many different levels. Very frustrating to me. And I find that it's, it's the education from the retailer to the consumer is a huge, huge place. We also have to, people like me, and that's why I take it so seriously, have to constantly be beating the war drum uh, for this. Uh, and it's why I feel it's so, so important because it is, it is, it is a way to check the social justice box, the environmental uh, caretaker box, uh, the healthy protein box. I mean, you just keep going on and on and on. I don't want to leave our audience in the lurch. I want to get to their uh, questions. Um, but I also want to make sure they hear because we're, we're going to try to weave them into other answers. But you also, audience, have heard our five incredible panelists already address some of these issues. The fourth pillar was collecting more comprehensive aquaculture data right? Which is part of that education process so that we can educate consumers, get on more lists of sort of, you know, approved sexy foods. Um, and uh, the last one, which is a, a, a slightly dry sort of wonky topic, but is really important, is reconciling nationalism in uh, the global market. Seafood is amongst the most highly traded food commodities in the world. And we talked about this before uh, several of our panelists did. U.S. is both the top importer and among the top five exporters uh, of seafood. Um, so we know that the movement is there. We know that the economy uh, will, uh, will support it because there's so much trade that goes on with it. Um, the uh, I want to thank James, Chris, Mike, Alf, and Laurel. I want to get to everyone's questions. Uh, Jennifer is going to uh, to tee those up. And uh, panelists, if if you want to answer a question, if it's specifically directed to you, please uh, go ahead and answer it. If it's a general question, if you got something to say, raise your hand. I'll call on you, and I think that's probably the smartest way to do it. And we'll take questions for ten minutes before we say good night. Jennifer, go. Go. So Casey Korn um, from YouTube has a question. It's, um, we know now that, uh, is it even worth to try getting the seafood certified organic or should we be pushing for more sustainability and regenerative certifications? And I'll give this one um, over to Alf Gorham because it is something that certainly we've been talking about quite a bit. I mean, what, what does that mean? Does it mean anything? We don't have that standard in the US and, and where do you fall on that? No, we, uh, you don't have that standard in the U.S. And we have, of course, the Debio uh, organic uh, EU standard is uh, applicable in, in the EU. But it's, uh, it's not, uh, in my mind, it's, it's never been something we have changed, changed to be part of because it's, uh, they are, they're doing good things, but they're, in some ways they're moving in the wrong direction. And there's been a long time without any updates on the standards and how they produce. And uh, so I, we, we believe that uh, uh, sustainable farming is, is the best way of doing it and not, uh, not organic. Organic is more, uh, the wording of it is uh, more known than the, the way of farming. Great, thank you so much. And I'm gonna um, actually toss the next question from Rebecca Morello to Chris, because the, this is about commercial fishermen. And I think it's really important to understand that Pacifico aquaculture was founded in a region where there were fisheries that were fished out. And you of all companies I know have two thirds of your employees were former fishers to some extent. Your offices are actually a former tuna cannery. And she asks, how do we get commercial fishermen on our team to work towards a common goal? So aquaculture and fishermen working together, how do we do it? Yeah, that's, that's something that we're super proud of at Pacifico. You know, a lot of people that, you know, now work at Pacifico were, you know, second, third generation fishing families that when those wild stocks were depleted, you know, the boats were tied up and no one was out there fishing and, you know, the, a lot of people are out of jobs and we're, we're super happy and proud to say that we've 
reemployed a lot of these people back in an industry that they are so familiar with and love so much. And, you know, it, we, we want to support the wild fishermen. We, you know, we want to support the, their hard workers. They've been doing it for a long time, you know, again, second and third generation or even longer families that have been doing it for a long time. We want to support those people and we want to support the ones that are, that are doing it well. We understand that when wild Pacific, or I'm sorry, when wild striped bass are running, our sales will probably slow down a little bit in certain areas because people want to take advantage of those fish. And we're all for that, but we want to be here to support, you know, that fish when the wild fish aren't available. So we need to exist together. We want to support each other. And I think that's super important. Thank you so much. So the next question actually is for Mike, I think, because it talks about the issues with aquaculture development in the states. And Hawaii has had an incredible collaborative relationship with, I mean, King Kamehameha farmed Kampachi, you know, hundreds of years ago off of the coast. You had what was depletive agriculture to such an extent when you look at, you know, big, big bad sugar production. And the question really relates to development of aquaculture in places like Alaska and others where there can be something that is more collaborative and inclusive. Um, how did that happen in the state of Hawaii? And, and how do we make that, um, give that, get that effect across the United States? so that we have more of that development in the U.S.? Uh, the truth of the matter, Jennifer, is uh, it was strongly pushed by former Senator Daniel Inouye, who uh, foresaw the end of sugar in that it just, they could not afford the price supports both in Louisiana and in Hawaii, uh, $13, or excuse me, 13 cents a pound when world markets were three cents a pound. Mm -hmm. So he made a very, very uh, concerted effort in permitting, and he set up a, a a uh, private government partnership with the uh, Oceanic Institute. They brought in Banna Mae White uh, shrimp. They tried to encourage, um, you know, the use of old fish ponds for both fish fin, or excuse me, fin fish, um, and also to start, you know, the budding uh, shrimp industry. And, uh, you know, the, the problem now is, I mean, the land costs are so expensive, labor is so expensive, you know, it's labor feed and energy is what drives off culture. And if you can't, you know, if you can't control any of those three elements, it's hard, you know, to, to put something together in Alaska, though you have the land in the area, you're also geographically a long, long ways away from your market. So you got to think about those issues as well. Uh, the permits that we have now, I don't think anybody else in the state of Hawaii could get. And it's um, so that's where government can help, especially with the regulations, in, you know, on the mainland U.S. And there are lots and lots of really good, you know, areas that could be developed for these grass systems. There's a lot of little independent guys out there that have like an old dairy farm barn and they've got a little anime white shrimp, you know, outside, you know, Minnesota or someplace and he's got fresh shrimp and he can drive it to market, you know, four days a week. And, uh, you know, it costs money to keep those, you know, things, you know, warm in the winter, but uh, it's really got to, it's, 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 there's so many tiers and so many levels that need collaboration to make this really successful. But, uh, you know, the government's got a big part of it. So, and that's, that's how it was able to go in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And Laurel, um, the next question is for you because um, this has to do with the role of foundations and um, and investment. And I know that um, there's been a tremendous amount of investment in aquaculture by your parent company, Kuna Del Mar. How do we how do we bring that to aquaculture in a robust way? Because part of this is, as Andrew has talked about, cause for the common good. You know, we need more aquaculture. We need to, in order. To to be able to have more access to delicious, important, nutritious fish and seafood in these food deserts where I would argue that fish and seafood is less available than things like other vegetables. So how do we get that seat at the table? What did that mean in terms of the investment from your parent company and the reasons why they saw this being so important both in the U.S. and beyond? So our parent company, Kuna Del Mar, as, as you mentioned, is their primary focus is building a sustainable source of good, healthy protein. And that extends beyond just a cobia farm. We have a, a, a umbrella organization that has a bunch of different organizations underneath it that includes even our um, sea station company, Anova Sea, who is generating the technology behind how we are farming the fish. And then we also have a, a sister company, Solo Zool Oysters, who are 
sustainably raising uh, oysters off the coast of Mexico. And we also have Earth Ocean Farms that, uh, uh, that's uh, farming Pacific Red Snapper um, off the coast of Mexico as well. And so there's also, um, there are a variety of different companies within this parent company. But what we're able to do is share the resources you know, work smarter, not harder. And we get a team of people who already have the expertise behind it and we're able to grow faster. And so as our parent company has um, dedicated themselves to investing in the sustainable future, each one of our platforms are able to grow, piggyback off each other, and it just makes the progress go that much faster. Thank you. And James, I think this last one is really for you because it has to do with um, value added products. And, and, the, and I know that you have had a background in smoked fish, trying to bring multiple products to market so that there's more exposure for these farms and to give them a little bit stronger foundation to build their business on. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a strong believer in, in value added products, especially for small specialty ras companies like us. You know, we, we don't produce a lot of fish compared to the amount of fresh bronze, you know, coming to the country, probably about two and a half percent. So so our responsibility to our shareholders and to the market is to maximize every fish that we harvest. Um, you know, and traditionally, when when farms uh, have harvested fish, there have been some fish that have gone into the bin. Um, by value adding, there's no reason for any fish to go into the bin. And um, so it, it's a good thing to explore. It, 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 uh, it increases the exposure to the market. If we have fresh brass fish to talk about, that's great. If we have a, a freshly smoked, hot smoked brass bronzino to talk about as well, that's even better. So we're kind of expanding our brand and expanding our offering to the market. And again, it all, it all feeds into education. Uh, but value add, I believe personally is essential for the success of companies like us moving forward. We would, probably yourself. All, we would probably all agree that um, Frozen also is the new fresh because for every single one of your companies, Frozen is becoming so important. Great freezing techniques, the importance of being able to get this out, have access to it and not be wasting fish you know, a lot of this, you know, comes down to making sure that we're producing efficiently as well. Andrew, well, that's, that's, that's part of the, but Jennifer, that's a really, really important point, but that's part of the education process as well. Frozen is one of those words that decades ago, I mean, when I first came into this business in the late seventies, you know, uh, frozen was somehow uh, less uh, 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 desirable from a quality standpoint and all kinds of things. The technology has helped with that immeasurably, you know, and the vast majority of fish that people are eating that they think is not frozen is in fact frozen. Um, and there's a lot of laws in the United States that allow based on catching principle or harvesting for retailers to label something as salmon or bronzino or striped bass or shrimp or cobia without referencing whether it is has been frozen or not been frozen. Uh, we have a lot of truth and labeling law issues that I think would help go a long way towards helping the aquaculture movement gain more traction with consumers uh, because consumers still have a hard time uh, trusting everything that they see at the retail level. So um, yeah, this has been an absolute fantastic discussion. First of all, uh, huge thanks to Jennifer for uh, putting this together. Uh, she introduced herself as uh, my partner in crime. Uh, she's actually one of my heroes and inspiration to me and works tirelessly for so many great causes. So thank you. Uh, James, Chris, Mike, Alf, and Laurel, thank you. And Jennifer, can you please mention the website again one more time where people, if they want more information, uh, if they would like to uh, see and learn more about our panelists, their products, and links to other important issues, including uh, the wonderful charitable organization that got us all here in the first place. Can you tell folks about that? 
Yes, so we are um, really excited. Uh, we've got, we're gonna put on the blog at quarryarctic.com. We're gonna put up on the blog um, all of this information so that you can reach everybody so that you'll be able to get the information about the farms, the background, um, we'll do that as well. We've got, um, so you'll get introduced to each one. We also are going to put up the organization that brought us together because Andrew um, had donated his time to an incredible cause, Sophie's Neighborhood. And, um, and so I, I auctioned uh, or bid on that auction item and it's Sophie's Neighborhood that's brought us together and we hope that all of you if you can can donate um, there are a lot of places and causes where you need to donate right now um, we'll make that one available to you because they've done such an incredible job supporting us to bring this conversation to fruition. Hey, and I've got another promise to, to people out there we will help spread the word another way because everybody talked about the ease of use uh, with fish. Uh, Jennifer and I will, will hook it up with all of our uh, panelists. Um, we have millions of people watching uh, AZ Cook's videos uh, and now they're live on Instagram on uh, Thursday afternoons uh, central time uh, and on my uh, IG account, which is chef, at Chef AZ. Um, and we'll get product from all of these fantastic places and show people exactly how easy it is to prepare this incredible seafood. Uh, and, and, and I think that is something when people can actually see the simplicity of it and how healthy and delicious that meal can be, I think it goes a long way to helping. So we'll throw that in as well. And we'll da do that over the course of the next eight, 10 weeks on Thursday afternoons uh, on my IG chat. So thank you to everybody for tuning in. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Jennifer. Eat more farm seafood. Yay. Thank you all very much for joining us. We appreciate you taking this journey. Remember, thank you. Look, for, look for your favorite fish farmer. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank